So thank you all for coming. Um, I think we'll start. Uh, let me introduce uh, Ashish, who will talk about mentorship in um, other FLOSS projects. Thanks. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit in this session about uh, how other free software projects I know have done a really good job, or sometimes not a great job, of mentoring. And then I want to open it up to discussion. Uh, I have one really vivid recommendation that comes from reading about all this. Uh, and hopefully, we'll talk about that. Um, let me quickly ask, uh, can everyone hear me OK? Am I speaking slowly enough? OK. I often speak way too fast, and I often fail to use consonants, which uh, makes me incomprehensible. So I hope that you'll tell me if I'm doing that. Maybe just like, ah, yeah, and there's a, a sign at the back that says, slower, please, if necessary. <laughs> Great. Uh, so uh, the first, uh, wait, uh, what I really, oh, I see. OK. I'm going to do one thing. Great. Um, yeah, so the first uh, free software project-wide mentorship effort that I heard about is Gnome Love, which started in about December 2004. Uh, how many of you heard, have heard of Gnome Love? <coughs> All right, cool. Uh, so it's uh, how many have heard of Gnome? Just take them a baseline. <laughs> OK, great. OK, so, so it, this isn't just like the people raising their hands know everything. It's that actually there's some knowledge gap. So great. Um, so. Uh, uh, yeah, the point of GNOME Love was to try to address the on-ramp for GNOME contributions from new volunteers in the community. And uh, so the first things they did were they made a wiki page that had recommendations for first-time contributions. So they linked to uh, recommended first tasks in a variety of GNOME sub-projects. They linked to the how to get started developing guide for a bunch of GNOME sub-projects. And the idea was that with that plus the mailing list, they would find new contributors to the project, direct them toward these new, these uh, entry-level contributions, and um, hopefully, therefore, uh, create more sort of ad hoc mentorship where people found out things that they could work on and then got help on them. And uh, shortly after December 2005, in like March, sorry, they began in December 2005, in about March, they began in about December 2004, and in about March 2005, uh, they added a Bugzilla tag also, so that uh, if something has keyword GNOME love on GNOME Bugzilla, then that means it's a good first task. And Bugzilla also links back to this wiki page, so people can get a sense that that's, this is what that means. And they also wanted to run uh, chat events, which they began doing. I don't know how many they ran, but they certainly ran at least one, which uh, were about helping people learn more about GNOME contribution. And at least their first one, they had a pretty big attendance. 10 to 20 people, as I recall. Uh, and when I say this, it's not because I was there. It's because I read the wiki pages. And I read the history of those wiki pages. So you can all go do this research yourself. Nothing special here. Uh, but the concerns that I have when I think about this now, eight years later, are uh, first trying to figure out who is the audience of GNOME Love. Is it people who are experienced C programmers that they want to uh, shepherd into the GNOME community? In which case, how are they reaching those people? Are they going to find going out to like top CS universities and finding the ones that teach C and then to emailing them all and directing them to this page? Uh, and the other question I have, well, and the answer is no, as far as I know, there is no directed outreach as part of GNOME Love. And the second question I have is that I don't think that the GNOME Love crew can detect if their efforts are really working. Um, they can see that some bugs that are marked GNOME Love get closed. But they don't really know, I think, if that's because of the wiki page, if that's because they were marketed on love at all. I don't think they really have a sense of if the people uh, who are new to those communities uh, benefited from the work they're doing. So uh, that was sort of the first mentorship effort that I learned about. And I've been thinking a lot more about mentorship over the past four years. The next major thing that struck me when I heard about it, and this was in real time, is Google Summer of Code. Ah, and my slide things are separated. One second. You can't tell, but my presentation console isn't working. OK, now you can tell. Great. So yeah, the point of you know, uh, Google Summer of Code in the beginning was to bring new students into the free software community. And according to Chris DeBona, who originally managed the program or managed the managers of the program, he thinks it's reasonably OK for retention. Um, <laughs> the structure, uh, does anybody here, does everybody in this, uh, does any person in this room not know the structural details of Google Summer of Code? 
I know it's a bad question to ask who doesn't know. Okay, great. Um, yeah. But yeah, okay. So uh, briefly, Google Summer of Code is a paid mentorship program between a free software community like Debian and a university student where the university student works for 12 weeks during the summer, gets paid, and has a specific task they work on, and has a specific mentor that's assigned to them. So it does mean there's a strong relationship between the mentor and the mentee, which is interesting and fairly different from what GNOME Love does. Um, it's also time limited to those 12 weeks and goal oriented. When you're doing these things, you really want to finish the project that you set, a, set for yourself at the beginning of the summer. Uh, I hear some scoffs. Um, but some questions I have about Summer of Code are how resilient is it to student failure in the sense that if a student doesn't manage to get all the work they wanted to get done, do they just feel so bad that they want to vanish from the community? Uh, and does the mentor feel like they wasted all that time uh, working on with this one student? I mean, in a lot of cases, I would say yes, they do feel that way. Uh, and it's, uh, I also think that Google Summer of Code isn't that resilient to mentor failure, which is a serious problem. So if I, as a GSOC mentor this summer, get really busy or go to Switzerland to go to a conference and can't mentor my student that well, it would possibly happen if I didn't arrange for better help that my student would just be like lost uh, without me. So uh, the one, uh, one interesting thing about Google Summer of Code in 2005 uh, and 2006 is the gender representation. So GNOME uh, in 2006 had 181 applicants for Google Summer of Code. And I want to, for those who know, don't raise your hands, but a pop <laughs> quiz, of these 181, what percent do you think were women? Yeah, of the 181 Google Summer of Code applicants for GNOME in 2006, what percentage of them were women? So I hear one, is that a 2% guess? I hear a 10%, I, hear a, I see a zero coming from this side. Yeah, so it turns out the answer is strictly zero. Uh, and uh, some GNOME people, in particular Chris Ball and uh, Hannah Wallach, who is also, both of whom are also slightly Debian people, especially Hannah, uh, <laughs> wanted to do something about this. So they took Google Summer of Code and they inserted the word women into it uh, and otherwise changed nothing. They, um, they, they ran the Women's Summer Outreach Program, which was a strict, uh, you know, tight mentor-mentee relationship. You uh, work with the mentor to figure out what your project will be. You get paid. You work on it for 12 weeks. The funding happened to come from a different source because they were, had exceeded the Google Summer of Code deadline in order to get this bad data. Uh, and when they did that, they got 100 applications for the Women's Summer Outreach Program. Uh, yeah? Was it also a separate code? Was it also a separate what? Uh, was this uh, GNOME Wimmer, Women Summer Outreach Program also separatist so that the applicants and also the mentors were only women? I think Do the mentors know? could be men and women, uh, but the applicants all had to be women, yeah. Um, this, this is one of my favorite things in free software mentorship history because it just shows that if you do anything to... It, it shows to me that the big missing question for how to find new people is the extent to which we communicate in a diverse way with the world. I think a lot of the reason that 100 people signed up for this, of whom six great people were chosen, is because the word women is in the title, it made people who received this, who are on pre-software project mailing list, think, oh yeah, I know what I could do to find more women for the project. Uh, and it's funny because they could have thought of that and forwarded the Google Summer of Code application information to their friends or whatever, to their like 500 friends of whom 100 applied. Uh, but you often have to do something to make people think about doing outreach at all. And by default, uh, because our mailing lists are where a lot of our communication happen and uh, where a lot of these announcements get posted, and those mailing lists are dominated largely by the kinds of people who are already in free software, you see hilarious results like the 0% applications for women for GNOME. Um, so yeah, to me the key lesson here is that doing outreach at all works great. Uh, so uh, the one, uh, one question mark here for the Women's Summer Outreach Program is that it happened once in 2006, thanks to the great effort of Hannah and Chris Ball, but it didn't really happen again until 2010. And that's because basically Hannah and Chris didn't structure their mentorship program to avoid themselves burning out. Uh, in 2007, OLPC became a huge thing. Chris Ball became super busy. Hannah was working on her dissertation in, in computational linguistics. 
Um, so having an, an exit plan for your mentorship system, whatever that is for you, the organizer, is really important. But yeah, so in 2010, Marina Jurakinskaya revives this program. Before reviving the GNOME outreach program, for, the Women's Summer Outreach Program, but renaming it the Outreach Program for Women, uh, before doing that, she just creates a list of mentors in GNOME, just wants a wiki page that says who can be a mentor in GNOME. And from a conversation I had with her two years ago, the sense I got is that she got four people to sign up for that list of possible mentors. But then once it was about a time-limited program, she got 40 or 50 people to sign up for that. So this suggests to me that uh, it's important to, to give mentors some sense that they're not giving away their entire lives. Uh, the, um, yeah, so she managed to run it increasingly frequently, uh, not just once during the summer of 2006, but two to three times per year. Uh, but she also makes sure there's a one-month break between, the, at least a one-month break between those sessions so that she has time to recover and the rest of her organizing team has time to recover. Uh, and another great thing about the GNOME Outreach Program for Women uh, is that it does not require the, the, your contributions to the project for which you're doing the paid internship. Again, it's a standard Google Summer of Code style uh, type relationship between the mentor and the mentee in the project. But because uh, there are lots of people who do want to show up and program, where possible, the Outreach Program for Women directs them to apply to Google Summer of Code. So uh, then they use up their limited OPW resources on women who couldn't even get funded by Summer of Code because they're doing non-code things. And uh, the, most recent, uh, the most recent version had 37 people, uh, and it had nine in GNOME, uh, eight or so projects participated, maybe more, and seven of those people were kernel developers, all of whom landed their first patch in the kernel in the first, in the weeks, in the first couple weeks of their internship. And that's thanks to the mentorship of Sarah Sharp. And uh, if you, I'm just like, People can just show up out of nowhere, get mentored well, uh, show up because there's a great outreach program that causes them to even hear about that free software community and believe they can participate, and uh, then they get patches landed in the kernel. I don't have that. I should sign up for these programs, maybe, except I can't. But that's fine, because I actually can manage myself just fine. Um, yeah, so basically, if you have this kind of directed mentorship, it really works. and so. For me, one of the lessons from the outreach program for women is that if a goal is to increase participation by women in whichever free software projects we're talking about, we all, all of our projects have limited mentor resources. We can just focus a large fraction of those mentor resources on a sub-problem of our projects that we care a lot about. Uh, one thing is, I don't know if these are resilient to the mentors flaking out, just like Google Summer of Code, but that's life. Uh, so I'd heard about all this. And I went to DebConf in 2010 and organized a Birds of a Feather called Debian for Shy People. And it was one of the most fun experiences of my life. We had this room like this that packed with people who were all like, wow, uh, yeah, uh, we don't like talking to people and are afraid of them, uh, just like me. So that was a super inspiring experience. So I thought, OK, uh, maybe I can try to apply this to the Debian mentors mailing list, because often, uh, people, I, I'm sorry, uh, often in my experience on Debian Mentors, people ask a question and then maybe don't know if they'll get an answer, don't get an answer, and if you subscribe to the mailing list and you just lurk, you think, who even knows if my questions are going to get answered, what's the point, this is so sad and distant. And uh, So what I wanted to do was set the community to have a goal of responding to those questions within four days. Um, even if the response should be as simple as, Sorry, no one's answered your question. We're all very busy, but uh, I hope somebody answers soon. That would be a lot more reassuring than radio silence. And moreover, seeing other people who you don't even know experience radio silence. So uh, what I learned from that is that I didn't have the bandwidth to succeed at that by myself. And I uh, set this goal and couldn't make it work. And so actually, we saw a great increase in Debian Mentors traffic when I declared we would all do this. Uh, and then it tapered off when we didn't succeed at doing it. The other thing is, uh, midway into this period, um, we, I was like, OK, uh, now that I've created this promise, I'd like to find out if we're actually succeeding at it. And then I like <coughs> spent a bunch of time writing mailing list scraping code that was more complicated than I expected, because that's software. And 
Uh, I should have done that first. If I had some goals that were measurable, I should have set up my measurements first. <laughs> it would have saved, uh, it would have made this a lot better. We could have had a little dashboard, and then other people could have been like, oh man, mean time response is six days. I could respond faster. So uh, with that failure under my belt, I thought, I know, I'll do something totally different. I'll run uh, how to get involved in an open source workshop at a college near where I was living at the time at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And uh, the idea of this was to have a, a day of lectures where we taught people how to get involved, uh, how bug trackers work, how version control works, um, how communities and conversations work, what plus free software licensing is. Um, and so it's kind of a very uh, welcoming approach to general free software mentorship. And I had as a personal goal that I wanted to have a pretty diverse attendee base. So I thought, OK, I might have to go work with the women in computer science groups, et cetera. Um, what I found, though, was that by doing nothing but writing a very welcoming invitation to, what, to the event and sending it to the computer science mailing list, 30% of my applicants for the event were women. And we ended up being over full. So we sort of sorted the applicants by how excited they were. And uh, the top 30, you know, women seem to be equally likely to be super excited as men. So 30% of our actual attendees were women. Uh, and we managed to do that without any gender-specific outreach because I think the text was written in a very welcoming way and because we sent it to the most diverse possible computer science mailing list we had at Penn. By contrast, if I had sent it to the computer club at Penn, the Dining Philosophers, the Dining Philosophers is almost entirely dudes. So if I then did that, I shouldn't be surprised to find if no women signed up because I didn't tell any women about it. So yeah, we did general uh, outreach there. Uh, and that was a lot of fun, but I didn't do a great job of capturing their enthusiasm and helping them stay active in the free software projects that they wanted to submit patches to in the second day of the workshop. So, okay, more failures by Ashish, but I'm slowly learning here. And uh, around the same year, I saw something really exciting, which I don't have much here in slides, so I'll just tell you. The, uh, the Fedora design team in 2009 and 2010 set up what they call design bounties. And these bounties are different than standard code bounties for money. They, uh, they operate in the following way. There's one person in the project who says, we really need this task done. So we really need a t-shirt design for our students who worked on Fedora over the summer. And uh, she writes a blog post that says, here's, why this is, here's what the task is. Here's why it is so important. Uh, I'm writing about this on my blog, which means that it's super easy to read, and it's not like you have to be part of any existing community, like if it were on a mailing list, basically. And I will offer you mentorship if you want to do this. And the prize for succeeding is not money. It's instead, you get commit access to the Fedora Design Subversion Repository, and you are part of our team. So the prize is the capacity to do more work. <laughs> uh, and I like. <laughs> Uh, but, but I think it's, it's also, I like to say the prize is sort of love. Like, you get inclusion in the community. You know that if you do this, uh, you're part of the Fedora design team. And you're part of something bigger. And uh, she also says in the blog post, leave a comment to lock this. And then you get 48 hours to attempt it. And then uh, I'll review your work and offer to mentor you and help make your work the best it could be. Uh, if we accept your work, great. Otherwise, the task is sort of unlocked. And it goes to the next person who left a comment. And what they found was they did this three or four times and got uh, a reliable, reliably they got somebody new to the community to show up, uh, many of whom have stuck around since. And I've uh, been trying to clone this in other free software projects. I did it twice in 2010, once for the Open Hatch website code in Django and once for the Students for Free Culture System, System Administration team. And in both cases, we found a young woman who was already on our mailing list who really wanted to get more involved and really wanted to be mentored on this to be part of that community. And both of those people are still active in communities that I'm a part of now. So I think that this model of its singular tasks really works. And it's a very different model than the GNOME Love model of uh, doing a lot of work to analyze a lot of bugs and list them and hope people find a page at all. It's really publicity oriented first. And it's one-on-one -on -one mentorship, but also it's time limited. Um, if, you know, there's no obligation for Maureen Duffy, who was the main mentor for these, to continue to mentor this new person past the first tw two days of that period. Um, it is, however, a lot of work still. You do have to like write up 
uh, all the skills you'll need to do it, or if not, uh, if people don't have the skills, link to like resources on those. Uh, but I think it's a really good example. So uh, on Wikipedia, they created an effort called the Tea House, where they want to welcome new people into Wikipedia by creating a social cafe-like space that might help support more new editors on the wiki. And this is because in 2012 and for the, some of the years before that, the Wikimedia Foundation was, uh, was and kind of remains terrified of the number of editors to Wikipedia declining over time. And also, they're unhappy with the relatively low gender diversity of the Wikipedia editor community. Although, if you talk to me after this, I think basically they're also really bad at statistics and do really low quality surveys. I have a different talk about that. But, um, but this effort, the Tea House, uh, addresses a real problem, which is getting more editors to be more active. Uh, and their strategy was to ping new editors on the wiki by sending them a personal message to their user account saying, hey, you're new here. Do you want to come to our social cafe-like space where people can friendly ask and answer questions? And so they have this like message board on a wiki, basically. But they have a little bit of UI that makes it more friendly. And they have a lot of contextual information that really tries to convince you this is going to be a friendly place. And uh, that's really most of the project, I think. And yeah, so it's many to many. It doesn't require this one-on-one -on -one mentor relationship like Google Summer of Code or uh, the Fedora Design Bounties. And on the front page to the Tea House effort, they show a sample question that has been answered so that people can get a sense that, yeah, questions do really get answered here. Um, and I kind of wonder if we just replaced the front page of Debian Mentors, like the list archive page, with one sample question that got answered. Maybe more people would be less afraid of that mailing list. Uh, Although maybe they'd be wrong, and they should be afraid of it, and so maybe we should actually fix it. But, um, but one of the things that they set up properly is that they had some goals, and they set up their measurements before uh, organizing this outreach effort. So they wanted to measure how many people participate in the tea house, how many questions get answered, and they define answer as just anybody replying to the message, uh, and how long that takes. So what they found was that. People who use the Tea House, who are new editors, compared to the people who don't use the Tea House, they edit 10 times as many articles across, that's within Wikipedia, and they make seven times more edits across all of the Wikimedia properties. And this is the most exciting one, I think. Twice as much of their content is not reverted. <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite an achievement, as Jimmy, I guess, is, uh, can tell. Uh, and uh, they, they have about 40 users per week asking and uh, asking questions who are new users. Um, and uh, of the people who are on the Tea House, according to their surveys, which have some bias problems, but leaving that aside, it seems that about three times as many more of them are women than in the control group. <clears throat> so perhaps this suggests that the newest editors who are least like existing editors benefit a lot from having this kind of conversational space, which in a way makes plenty of sense. Uh, the people who don't need this conversational space will do fine without it. Uh, having said that it's three, to three times as many women compared to the baseline population, it's still majority men participating and asking and answering questions on the tea house. And uh, one thing that they do that Debian doesn't really do is that they, uh, on the tea house, there's a section where you are encouraged to write a little bit about yourself, put your photo on a page, and uh, one of those users <clears throat> is selected to be shown on the front page of the Tea House plus one of the people who is answering questions. So uh, they asked participants in the Tea House, does it matter that we ask you to write about who you are, what you want to get out of your experience at Wikipedia, and the fact that you put a photo there? And basically, people say yes. Uh, it's not only nice to write about what I want to get out of my experience at Wikipedia, it's also really nice to see what other people want to get out of their experience at Wikipedia, editing and contributing. So uh, I've sort of aggregated a kind of concept inventory in a loose sense of ways to categorize and understand mentorship programs. The first one is the question of who gets, who is part of that mentorship program. So with GNOME Love, it's a very open, uh, almost dangerously open in the sense that you have no idea who's using it uh, system. Other mentorship programs are more closed, like Google Summer of Code, where you have to be selected. And the Tea House is somewhere in the middle, where it's open to anyone, but 
the people running it do send invitations, and the people who receive invitations are more likely to actually participate by some huge factor. Um, one question for me about mentorship programs is about if they, if, uh, when you participate in the mentorship program, do you end up with a new human connection to somebody? So in GNOME Love, if you go and click around on bugs, you don't really end up with a new human connection. But on the tea house, somebody answers your question within an hour, and you see their username, and you click around, and you maybe, while waiting, click around the social profile. So you're like, oh, and by social profiles, I mean there's a wiki page with standard wiki ugly image and like paragraph next to it with weird alignment. So we're not talking about like iframing Facebook or something here. Uh, but it, even that does a great job of building human connections. Um, uh, the tea house is interesting in that it is uh, hopefully resilient to mentor mentee failure. And you can see that in part because people sort of wander in and out of who answers questions. People have different degrees of activity over time. Um, and that works out really well because they somehow have set up a structure where people feel willing to answer a question or two and then wander off. Um, I think one of the big questions for me about mentorship projects is sort of why bother, uh, which is to say, can we identify the people or the groups of people who are benefiting from this mentorship program? So in the case of the Tea House, the goal is to make Wikipedia's editor community more vibrant and more gender diverse. And so hopefully the readers of the encyclopedia benefit, the uh, other authors on the encyclopedia benefit, the individual authors who are getting mentored benefit, the people answering questions hopefully benefit because they're having some fun answering questions. Um, with GNOME Love, there's definitely some thought into whose life it's supposed to improve. Users of GNOME and the other developers on the GNOME projects that we're inviting, they're inviting people to. Um, but I think that basically with the Tea House, they put in a lot more thought into thinking about which people are affected by the program and trying to make sure it was a good experience for them. So by contrast, with Google Summer of Code, um, you know, I think as a boss later today, I was, <laughs> was hearing some grumblings that maybe there is. Yes, OK, there's a boss on the Google Summer of Code tomorrow. And uh, there's some grumblings in, among many projects that participate in Google Summer of Code that the students get a lot out of it. The mentors maybe get something out of it, although they lose a lot of time. And the project maybe, maybe, maybe get something out of it. And if you, sort of show up to, <laughs> if you sort of show up to a mentorship program without thinking clearly about what you want to get out of it and how you'll know if you're getting that out of it, you're unlikely to get as much out of it. Uh, which brings me to actually measuring the results you're getting out of it. So uh, I don't think that in Debian for GSOC we uh, measure, we go and look and see which GSOC projects actually succeeded and which contributors stay around. Uh, maybe we just in an ad hoc way. Yeah. Uh, if one of the goals is to, is to create new contributors, informally we do that. Uh, but if the, one of the goals is to create more contributors, then it seems wise to ask the question, you know, is the children learning? Uh, are the people actually stick around, sticking around? Um, and uh, interestingly, the Tea House is goal-oriented. Um, it helps people answer questions about encyclopedia articles they're trying to write. Um, some mentorship programs aren't really goal-oriented. So um, I mean, I guess a kind of like uh, the Debian mentorship mailing list is some combination of supposed to help you get review on your packages um, just for you to like hang out and find out more about Debian. Um, it's also definitely not time limited, whereas uh, some of these programs I've talked about are. And there's this classification about uh, is it sort of one mentee to many mentors? Is it one mentor to one mentee? Is it uh, you know, many to many? Uh, the Tea House is many to many. Um, things like the Debian Women Mentoring Program from three years ago, and I guess that continues, is sort of many to one, where there's like four-ish mentees per one mentor. Is that about right? Uh, well, uh, initially, the, the, the mentoring program is one to one. You okay. have uh, mentees and mentors, but you are usually assigned uh, one to one. OK, yeah. Um, and there's one other question here, which uh, I failed to write, which is, to what extent is that mentorship visible? Um, which kind of relates back to the resilience to mentor-mentee failure. So on the Tea House, if somebody's question isn't being answered, any other answerer can go and click uh, and answer. Whereas if you do private mentorship, then other people in the community can't tell if people are succeeding at the mentorship goals. And sometimes that's OK, but it's just important to know 
to consider the publicness with regards to the resilience to the failure. Um, so uh, I have about 15 minutes left, and I guess I want to cover a couple of other mentorship efforts, but I'll try to do so briefly so we can have some conversation time at the end. Um, the first is Easy Hacks by LibreOffice. And in a nutshell, this is a combination of a keyword on the bug tracker, like GNOME, for what makes a good, easy task, but also about 16 other keywords for how hard the task is, what kind of skills it requires, and a collection of wiki pages on LibreOffice's website that tell you, uh, that let you browse these from the wiki rather than from the bug tracker. So you don't have to learn Bugzilla first. You can read wiki text, or we'll read a rendered wiki text. Um, and they found that it's super helpful to have a hand curated list of what these easy tasks are and to write a bit about how you would go solve them rather than just tag the bugs. Um, so I mentioned that uh, at the Open Source Comes to Campus event that I ran three years ago and that I've been running a bunch lately still, um, we sort of ask new contributors to find a task in a project they want to work on and then uh, mentor them during the day, but then afterward have no follow-up, no really strong follow-up plan. We sort of say, you can email us if you want, and nearly nobody does, and I wish they would. Uh, by contrast, Upstream University runs a very similar program of you know, teaching skills and then getting people to decide what free software project bug they want to solve. But what they also do is say, now that you've been here for these two days, uh, every time you do eight hours of work personally on this, toward this bug, you should ping us and we'll schedule a one-hour IRC chat with you and your Upstream University mentor and we'll go and read what you've done and tell you how you th we think you can improve your contribution. So then they sort of serve as side input for patch review and helping you communicate better with the project. Uh, some of you may know the phrase, well, anyway, never mind. Um, the, the idea, though, is that um, you will continue to be mentored until your contribution sticks to the project. Um, and that's been very successful for them, although with, with one or two exceptions. But basically, many, many of the people who show up to those programs really want to put in the work. Uh, it's just a matter of making sure that they have an expectation from the mentor that the mentor will be there for them, and that that then works out. Um, the favorite thing that I've talked to a handful of you about in person and sent obscure emails to various Debian mailing lists about is the uh, Ubuntu developer advisory team. So let me clarify that here, and then talk about how I think I want to port that to Debian. Uh, so Ubuntu has this semi-secret team called the Developer Advisory Team. Uh, on their wiki page, they talk about their goals as greeting new contributors, uh, encouraging people to apply for developer status in the project, and contacting people who have been lost, who somehow uploaded a bunch of work, of new packages that got sponsored, but then they wandered off. And uh, I see this wiki page, and I see this was edited a year and a half ago, almost, and I say, oh, OK, this is like those blogs where people say, Oh man, blogging is so much fun. I'm going to blog more. And that's the most recent post, and it's from like 2010. So that's, uh, that was my impression of the developer advisory team. I had sort of written them off because everyone's always like, oh yeah, we need to mentor more. And, uh, but it turns out that they are pretty active. They just don't talk about it in public. In public, they talk a little bit about this survey they send new contributors. Uh, I'll gloss over some of this. It's in the slides, I guess. I'll put them online. Uh, they do send a survey to new contributors, but the really cool thing that they do uh, is they secretly, they track new Ubuntu contributors with a tool that they try not to tell anyone about because they're embarrassed that people are being tracked by them. Uh, and to do that, they use a table in the Ultimate Debian database, Ubuntu Upload History, and they just search for people whose uploads are, have been, who did their first upload in the past three months, and they show those people on a list uh, and the idea of this list is if you are part of the developer advisory team, your mission is to go say hello to one of those people, send them a greeting email, and be their welcoming point to the project. And then um, you say that you did so, you click a button, and then they get removed from that list, and you have more people to go greet if you want to. Uh, or if not, then maybe you'll do so in two weeks more when you visit the page again. So I think that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think that we should clone this. We should uh, query the upload history table, not the Ubuntu upload history table, and uh, reach out to Debian contributors who are new and not necessarily create this really tight mentor-mentee relationship, 
uh, not necessarily do anything goal-oriented with this yet, but just welcome people. Um, and we can expand that beyond people who've gotten their packages sponsored by uh, either extracting more information or querying UDD, and Lorman and I will maybe hack on that later today. Uh, so uh, this, uh, yeah. Yeah, about this, I think the looking at upload history is a bit is looking too late in the process, probably yeah. for many people. I agree with that. Um, it would be better to, to look at uh, ITPs or uh, RFPs or whatever. But uh, yeah, totally. We yeah. So the the story with this is that I Open Hatch has a Google Summer of Code student because we're interested in taking the Ubuntu code, making it generic, having uh, me plus a Debian welcoming team. All the way have to figure out what the name of it is, do it for Debian, and then make it useful for a variety of projects also. So in, in addition to upload history being too late. I, I, I like the idea of including bugs. We should basically make sure that the source data is broad in scope to include non-packaging contributors. For example, it might include people who have posted a mail or two or three on a developer-focused mailing list or, uh, or translation commits or, uh, or uh, significant answering of questions. I'm not sure how this would be tracked in a s na without natural language processing in IRC. Or you know, or showing up at DevConf and yeah. not having done anything before. Yeah, totally. It's just, a, it's just a matter of writing the code to pull in identities from those sources. Yeah. I, I, I did this. <laughs> it's on the video. Yeah. I just want to say that there might be quite a lot of overlap with Enrico's Dev yes. contributor stuff here. So yes. he's planning on tracking basically everything everyone does. So you probably want to. Yeah, exactly. I was chatting with him yesterday uh, about that. Did you? Yeah, one of the of the things that, well, we get complaints every now and then in different projects is the the um, interface that people, for example, in Debian find uh, mailing lists and, and stuff very intimidating. Would it be a possibility to also offer some kind of uh, initial contact easy w easier way? I don't know exactly what because I don't like forums, but uh, is this being thought out? Well. Um, if I understand correctly, you're saying some Debian contributors find the mailing list interface overwhelming or intimidating. At least um, um, Debian newcomers, Debian wannabe contributors, at least. Yeah, and um, I mean, I certainly felt that way. Uh, it's why I like, hung out on Debian, various Debian mailing lists for years before trying to do anything useful for the project. And um, I mean, I think part of that maybe can be addressed by having a contact person who introduces you to the project. So you can then, if this mentee can just email the person who greeted them and say, so these mailing lists. Should I really join them? Should I really talk on them? And you'll say, yes, 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 and they'll finally get it, hopefully. Um, but uh, fixing, uh, does, is that enough to answer your question? I don't really remember. No, my, my question was that, mm, that's a, that's a fact that uh, many people find that intimidating because I've, I've talked with new guys and people who try to approach Debian, and my 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 idea was: uh, is this uh, being thought of, taken into account? I mean, what's your suggestion regarding this? Apart from the from the initial human contact, like for example, someone wants to get because I mean, many of the Debian contributors or, or developers and stuff came to Debian by knowing already some uh, yeah. someone in Debian. But imagine that someone, and that's the case of, of some other people, just want to, to try to do something. They go in, they get into the Debian page, they get into the new, the welcoming page, the new the Debian mentors page and stuff. Uh, and that some of those people are like, uh, they pull away because they, they, they're not comfortable with the interface. That's one of the right. things that maybe you want to, maybe doing better or not, I don't know. Uh, I mean, how to, how's, uh, what's your approach to that or your, what do you think about that? Uh, I mean, I guess I think a few things about that. One is that it's a real problem, and that the Wikipedia Tea House, in the if you read the report about their first six months, um, they part of the feedback they got was uh, one experienced Wikipedia contributor said, "I was really concerned and honestly unhappy that you guys wanted to change the interface to make it more friendly for newcomers." And then when I but I didn't complain then, and then I participated in the system. And I was like, oh, wow, this interface is, makes me feel totally more welcome, and it's much more inviting. And it's still like an ugly MediaWiki site. But uh, there's a bunch more Chrome around it, and like you have to go through slightly fewer actions to reply to people. 
Um, <laughs> so um, it's, a really, it's a real problem, and it really ought to be fixed. Uh, the other thing I want to say is I'm unlikely to be a person involved in fixing that in the next six to 12 months. Um, I hope that other people are. Um, but uh, so I'll do this thing first, and then I'll see. Uh, but the other, th I mean, uh, problems with the Debian mailing list can likely be fixed by writing a different archiving skin. Um, so, and actually, the Fedora project has been working on <laughs> um, uh, an archiver called HyperKitty. Hyper I was like, Kitty Mail? No, HyperKitty. Like, hy like Piper Mail, but not Piper. Uh, anyway. And um, it sort of puts people first and uses gravatars to show images of people's heads or whatever they make their gravatar. Um, yeah. I, uh, uh, yeah, it also allows you to reply in line uh, via a web interface. So it doesn't need you to use email, which is maybe a hurdle to start contributing. So uh, maybe the right answer is, who in this room is interested in spending two hours today trying to set up HyperKitty? Is that right? Uh, OK, cool. Uh, I'll find you guys after. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I am not really sure if uh, it's uh, really the interface only which is the problem. I guess it's the environment and uh, the contact with the people and uh, for outsiders finding out what is the job they can do and what they can be involved with, but, but there they can be successful and things like that. This is also a good approach and maybe a step in that direction, making the interfaces a bit shinier or th things like that, but maybe not the core problem. Yeah, well, I think it's both. They, we should just fix all the problems at once. It's possible. I can reply to that. I'm a Debian developer now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been connected to the Debian project for a long time, like, I don't know, I've been using Debian for 10 years, started contributing through Google Summer of Code in 2007, <coughs> and I had a really hard time to, like, figure out what can I contribute with. I'm a develop, I'm a programmer, so I wanted to develop a package or whatever, and like, oh, I'll take some orphan package that I don't use and don't have any usage for, so why should I package that so I didn't, because it doesn't make sense. But it would be n really nice, and we talked about this on the uh, welcome to DevConf uh, session with Enrico, like uh, at the start, and that's an issue for probably a lot of people. I think. So I don't have any solution, but it would be nice to like have a, like a, I don't know, welcoming page that's not developer's corner, that's more like easy. Right, yeah, and I think um, one of the things that seems clear to me about GNOME Love is that it takes the approach of tagging and then forgetting, uh, and I don't like that as much as the LibreOffice EV Hacks approach of if you're going to tag bugs with their easiness, it's worth spending five times as much time also writing how to fix them. Uh, apparently, I have one minute left, so everyone should ask a question at once. I, I, I agree with, with the last statement uh, that uh, uh, if uh, someone is not an insider, kind of in Debian, it's really, really hard to get involved. So it's, it's, uh, I guess, in my experience, it's uh, very hard to get involved. You look at the page, you think you can uh, contribute there, and you just realize, oh, it's just much more complicated than I think, think of. So uh, Andreas wants to say something, but I want to quickly say two things first. There's a Debian Mentors Boff tomorrow at 3.30 PM. Uh, and secondly, um, I have a question for all of you. Who in the room is interested in periodically maybe sending emails to new contributors who we've detected are uh, and now becoming to be active in the project? OK, uh, who else in the room can take a picture of you all or write down your nicks? Jimmy. Wait, everyone put your hands up again like that. And then Jimmy, and now say your names in order. You. Oh, yeah, I know you. But say them so he can write it down. <coughs> Yergen Nagi. <laughs> yeah. Seraphim. Uh, who else? Was that a hand? OK, per. Uh, if you're interested in pe periodically sending emails to new contributors to greet them in Debian, 
raise your hand. Raise and the name tags. Oh, yeah, and, and or put your name tag up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, oh yeah, this video, right, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll just like press space on the recording, okay. I, I just have another comment uh, how uh, you could uh, try to involve people. We are doing um, in Debian Mid sprints since 2011 with not only Debian developer but users. And we have, in my, in my talk on Monday, I have a serious proof that this increased all me, uh, me, uh, metrics we did of new developers. So if you find some group, some team meeting, just involve other people and invite them. And maybe I'll tell you more about in, in my talk this is afternoon. Can I give you a high five? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good enough for me. Okay, okay, one more. Yeah, users are great. Uh, user testing is something we don't do very much, which is to ask people to try to achieve tasks with Debian and then watch them fail, and then fix the things that made them fail. So we should do that more. Yeah, for... Uh. Uh, I haven't been, I've been, uh, since 2010 was the last time I was really, uh, I've got a kid in between now and then. So I've been busy with real life. But the, an idea I had then is to have like a one week or so IRC, uh, who had that? Like IRC mentorship with uh, packaging or whatever. And uh, has, has there been any such effort? I've missed that. Yeah, periodically. Uh, do you want to talk about that? I think uh, time is up. So, I mean, you're all welcome to continue the discussion uh, around its lunchtime now, right? Uh, yeah, 15 minutes until lunch. So, exactly. We have lots of time over lunch to talk. So, please, uh, thank you to Ashish for his presentation and everybody for the contribution. Yeah. Okay, yeah, now go back to talking. Also, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yes, I just wanted to say that, that the, we, we already tried that in, in different projects, including Debian, and the IRC tutorials are not enough. They don't, they don't really serve as, as tutorial. They might be complementing in regarding you can do feedback with particular questions, not as good questions as you would do in a, in a mailing list, but it's not enough. And so I, th I think we should, re th we should maybe rethink Especially regarding new new, r new generations, whether we should change our our tutorial ways, maybe even doing some some video casts or some something like that, which is more. I have some ideas to make IRC tutorials pop, uh, yeah. which is basically to make sure that you the information about them gets out to people who really care about them. So to make sure that they're part of the welcoming message if there's a tutorial coming up, and to capture contact information for people when they come to IRC tutorials. So we can then follow up with them and shepherd them into the project. Yeah, this was sort of my idea. Since I do a lot of, uh, well, everything is real life, even the internet, but face-to-face uh, -face meetings where I do packaging tutorials. So this was like one way to do it on the internet. But videocast is super. Yeah, what I mean is that uh, I've been doing for the last uh, two years. I've been receiving as a student for the last two years some of the or some of the course of Coursera and and some of these uh, nice things that some universities are doing, and they don't seem that hard to do in the w technical way, and maybe that could be a, a, an easy way to, to get people, at least to, to make people learn or to ease the, the entry point. Probably not, I mean, probably uh, IRC is not the, the best way to, to teach. I guess the one question I have is how would we reach how would, once we've created the content, how will we find people and cause them to read the content or watch the content? And it looks like Per has an answer. Okay, so uh, I know a lot of people that I, I'm f totally fine with reading text myself. I love just digging into a really fat, thick text document, and I'm not scared about it. But I was once, sort <laughs> of. But then there's people with dyslexia that are really super talented people, and if they get a video, they're like, they have the greatest time of their life. It's like, okay, I can't read a manual page, but W watching someone do what I want on a video cast is like good. So I think I think videos is super. So I have a question: Who wants to take Lucas's packaging tutorial uh, PDF slides and make them into a video today? Uh, or if you don't make them into a video, make them into an ASCII screencast so people can watch the terminal stuff. These are awesome. If you haven't, I guess there will be. I guess there will be a presentation or a talk today, or or maybe. Tomorrow, tomorrow about this, yeah. So Wait, what is that talk tomorrow? 
Oh, I don't know, but I just talked more. I wasn't going to answer that. But uh, the in the packaging tutorial, there are four or five different practical sessions, and those would be really good targets for ASCII cast. Yes, I don't know how to do that myself. I don't make your pointers, but uh, uh, yeah, someone could take this and do it with their tech. Who wants to make an ASCII cast of those? It'll take you less than an hour and a half, probably, to at least to try to start. Come on, I need a hand. OK. But I need help doing that. OK, great. I'll happily help you. We'll talk at lunch. Uh, but uh, since I seem to be here, uh, I think ASCII.io is a web page where you can record ASCII screencasts. And they have a free software tool that records your terminal session and then lets it be played back in a browser, not as a video, but as like text. Uh, I'll show you. What do you say? It doesn't work? Yeah, OK. I was like, what? It worked great for me. Uh, other people ask questions while I figure out how the internet works. Yeah. Related to that, how do you see that package to integrate with the existing packaging tutorial package? Back. Look, it's text. And it got recorded by this like random script. Totally random script? No. Uh, although, th <laughs> I, I don't remember if. I mean, as far as like, anyone can tell, yes, it's a totally random, unauthenticated download script because that's the hip way to install software nowadays. Sorry, Debian. But uh, we should package it, whatever. But yeah. In fact, in my crazy opinion, once we get that written, we should just have it lying around on the bottom of Debian.org. When you scroll down, it just shows you how to make a package. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between script, between that and script and script replay? Uh, <laughs> the difference between script replay and this is that it makes a web page just to repeat for the video. Not that we're recording anymore or something. I don't know. <laughs> per, are you convinced now? You're going to save us all. I was at this uh, Debian for Shy People uh, session also, and the room was probably half this size. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I raised the question about gender diversity then, mm. and from what I remember, it wasn't really uh, welcomed that question. So I'm so no. so I'm so happy to see you now, <laughs> and actually, like half your talk is about diversity and how to increase diversity. I'm shocked and appalled at myself three years ago. I'll have to go see the video and see what you mean. Yeah, I, my memory might be blurry also, but thanks. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I can totally relate to what Per said about uh, not knowing what to do. And I was thinking about it at the uh, Debian Woman talk as well. Maybe it might be helpful to have a list of wish, li uh, wish list items, as in things you can work on, but there, are, there is no pressure on doing so. As in, if you succeed and uh, do that, uh, yeah, that would be great to have, but there's not, uh, like, if it's a bug and you try to fix it and you break it even worse, then that. And also, if you have those all that. If you have those all in one place, so you can easily search for them. Uh, that sounds great. It should be a list of five bugs on a wiki page. Who will write that? Come on. Not necessarily bugs. Oh, or I tasks, yeah. yeah. I mean, actually, with, uh, with bugs themselves, uh, we've observed that we have the gift tag already, but it's usually easier for the maintainer to actually fix the bug if it's easy to fix than to, to tag it. It's, it goes faster, and then you don't have to review any, any no. patch or anything. <laughs> so yeah, it's just easier to fix it than to give it away. But that's totally not the point, like Per says. Um, but that does mean, therefore, that um, when, um, if, when we're talking about these sorts of gift or uh, entry-level tasks, the person whose package it is or whose community it is really needs to care about the onboarding part. I think uh, what I would 
uh, uh, if we just ran a Fedora Design Bounty clone once per two months, where somebody in some sub-project said, here's a task we need you to do, uh, it's easy, I'll mentor you, I think that would go a long way to addressing this. It would also be time limited, so people wouldn't be worried about leaving their bugs as a gift too long. Um, I have a comment as well in these lines. Um, I think it might be a bit heretic, but for me as well, from personal experience, it's kind of hard to go to a main T well, public web archived mailing list and ask a question without knowing whether I'm not going to make a total ass of myself, right? So maybe it would be good to have some point of contact that is actually a private mailing list, which you don't need to subscribe. You just send there. There's a bunch of people who like to be welcoming, and they answer you in private and advise you where to write your question publicly and tell you that's not that bad and might even check your mail you sent there so you're not making a total ass of yourself. Just to get that feeling out of the person. Um, so I talked about calling something like the Debian welcoming team. Is it okay if we call it the Debian member encouragement team, or is that just weirdly bureaucratic? <laughs> okay, cool. We'll call it Debian welcoming. Maybe we'll make a mailing list like that that's private for it also. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, Per had the mic then. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe use contributor instead <laughs> of member? OK, yeah. Oh, and then it's like contributor encouragement team. We'll, whatever, we'll call it Debian welcoming. The, the weird thing about calling it the welcoming team is that I, if we finish, if we fully clone the Ubuntu strategy, then we'll also have the welcoming team be getting in touch with people who like, stopped uploading for three months, which is kind of curious. But I don't really care. It's fine. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, the video team needs to go eat lunch. Yeah, I, I thought the video was already over. Okay. Okay, well feel free to end the video if that's what you're saying. Okay, yeah. All right, I mean now we can leave the mic open so for discussion. Yeah. So just uh, something about the idea of having uh, tasks, well, easy task for new contributors. We discussed that already, but um, uh, one idea could be to have a how oh, can I help package that uh, plugs into apt hook so that when you install a package, you get a list of easy tasks for the package you just installed. And well, if any, or, 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 li or list if Mention, mention it if the package is orphaned, then you could adopt it, maybe. And that's actually really easy to do. Mm, probably. So you're going to do it, you said, right? No, that's not what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, OK. I, I'm going to do it uh, probably when I have more time next year. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> but uh, well, I can provide uh, directions for doing it uh, now using UDD as a data source to identify tag. Stuff like that. So if you are interested, just talk to me. I have the same concerns as that you had. That's how, how we how do we make that? I mean, what you said is is really true. Uh, it takes me less time to just fix the bug than to to explain anything. So so and it, I think it's that that's general for for all the the packages and all the, the teams in in Debian. In, in so I mean, how how do we get over over that? How how do we manage to to make people mm, well describe the bugs, the easy bugs, instead of fixing them? Uh, well, we have some answers, so I guess I'll try to hear your your answers before I try answering. I Wait. think the problem yeah, is. Can I get uh, in the back first because he had his hand up? Um, I think the answer should be just we don't, because um, that's. It, that's a problem you can't avoid when you want to mentor. I have never mentored something which would not have been easier for me to do myself. <laughs> <coughs> I don't think that's... I think mentoring only works if the mentor knows that 